one man defied the darkness, bringing life through obedience. From the creators of Avatar, the true airbender, comes the last Adam. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Can we stretch out our hands to that corner of the room and pray for them? Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Uh, my name is uh, Femi Omotayo, and uh, some of the folks call me PF. Can we get the sound right? And I am the lead pastor at New Covenant House. Amen. You know, I, I've been saying this for a few weeks now that um, this is not a, a, a TED talk, right? Please touch anyone and say this is not a TED talk. Uh, and this morning, I want to teach. Amen? Amen. So please say, uh, good morning, Professor. Good morning, Professor. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Professor Femi. All right. You, you, guys, you guys need help. <laughs> okay, so we're, we're doing a, a, can I use the handheld? I didn't do sound check, yeah. Thank you. Amen. Hallelujah. Host one. Host one. Which one should I use? This one? Huh? So how many of us are, are familiar with the story of how God created the heavens and the earth? If you're familiar with it, can you just raise your hand? Awesome. I grew up hearing that God created the heavens and all the earth over a period of seven days. Yeah? Is that correct? Awesome. And on one of those days, the sixth day, God created man. And he named that man Adam. So... From the story of creation, we know that Adam was the first man to ever live on the face of the earth. And the Bible tells us that God made him, Adam, in his own image and his own likeness. Amen? In Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 uh, to 27, the Bible says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Let us go back a little bit, back to verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that, touch him and say, so that. Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, animals and all the creatures that move along the ground. The Bible says God made man in his own image and in his own likeness. I know that when we read the word image and the word likeness, our instinct would be to make a distinction between those two words. But the truth is, image and likeness mean the same thing. Amen? In the Hebrew language, there is a principle called parallelism, where the same thing is said in two separate ways. Now, that is done not to create a distinction between those things, but to emphasize Amen, to make an emphatic statement. So God wanted us to understand that he made man in his own image. Amen, in the image of God made he them. Now when you, when you see man, 
What that means is that to some degree, he bears a resemblance to God. Amen? Amen. The Bible says in Psalm 8, verse 4 to 6, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Human beings that you care for them, you have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands and you put everything under their feet. Now that word in that verse that is translated as angels is actually a, a Hebrew word that is pronounced as Elohim. Turn to your neighbor and say Elohim. Elohim. And Elohim is a name of God. But it is the name of God that refers to God's creative capacity or God's creative ability. So when the Bible says uh, uh, he has made man a little lower than angels, what it should actually say is that he has made man a little lower than God the creator. Amen? Amen. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The psalmist didn't come up with this by himself. Amen? He, he, he said what he said under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And what he is saying is that man is actually a little lower than God. Man is not a carbon copy of God. But there are certain things about man that, that is like God. Amen? We, we have certain capabilities that is different from the rest of creation. We are a spirit that has a soul and lives in a body. We have the ability to love. We have creative ability. We have the ability of rational thought. And we have free will. Now, if you look through all of creation, you might find some animals that have some of these capabilities. But you will not find any that has all. Amen? For example, have you ever seen an orca? You know what an orca is? It's a killer whale. Right? It's a whale. It's a massive whale. It's those ones that look very cute. Black with white, huge white dots. Those are the most dangerous animals in the ocean, and they are the cutest. <laughs> Have you ever seen an orca hunting for a seal or a shark? If you watch them hunt, you see strategy. They, they will use the ocean to drown their prey. They will use their tails to create waves that overwhelm their prey. That tells you that they are thinking. That tells you that they are making rational decisions depending on the situation or the circumstance. But they do not have a capacity to love. And they do not have free will. They respond to their bellies. Amen? Amen. But another meaning to being made in the image of God is that we are his governing authority over all of creation. Remember, the Bible says God made man in his own image so that, so that he may rule. One of the reasons why we are made in the image of God is so that we can rule. By being made in the image of God, God is giving us authority over all of creation. Now, in the olden days, kings and rulers would have their images placed all over the areas where they had authority. And those images... Those statues were considered the king's representative. And people were required to worship them as if the king was right there. So not only do we look like God, we are also God's representative. Amen? We are the apex of God's creation. God could have made all of creation on day one, day two, day three, day four, and day five. And then on day six, he could have made angels and given angels rule over all that he created. But instead, what did he do? He created man. He really didn't have to. He could have empowered the lions or even the orcas with all the things that they needed to have dominion. But he instead, he created man. And then the question you have to ask yourself is why? Why did he make us? My brothers and sisters, God made you so that he can have a multi-dimensional, a multi-faceted relationship with you. And if you look through the Bible, you will see different facets or different aspects of what God wants from you and I. Different aspects, different facets of the relationship that he desires from you and I. On one, in one dimension, he wants us to be his friends. In another dimension, he calls us his son. 
In other places, he refers to us as his bride. He wants you to know him. He wants you to experience him. He wants to be able to interact with you. And most importantly, he wants you to choose him. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. Touch your name and say, God wants you to choose him. He gave us the capacity to love. He gave us the capacity to interact with him. He gave us the capacity to perceive him. But then he also gave us the capacity to choose not to love him. If I were God, I would not have given human beings that capacity. Amen? You know, I've heard people say, ah, you know, what is love except the person chooses you? Just love me. I don't care whether you choose me or not. If I had my choice, I would not allow my wife to choose me. She is married to me and she's not going anywhere. But is that really love, though? Are you really a person if you cannot choose? Then you're just a robot living out a program. Amen? But God gave us choice so that he, we can choose to love him. But when Adam sinned after being led astray by Eve, I don't understand. Am I saying something that's not in the Bible? Ah, uh, was he sleeping? Whether he was sleeping or not. Eh? Thank you, my brother. The devil went to Eve and said to Eve, has God said? Eh? Eve went to Adam and said, eat. Woe betide the man that does not eat when his wife says eat. So, Adam, he ate the fruit. Amen? But you know, we've talked about this. He didn't eat an apple. He ate the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And by eating that fruit, he stained the whole of humanity with sin. Because of Adam, every human being, listen, every human being born from a man, every human being descended from Adam is born a sinner. Even if that individual has not done anything sinful. Think about that for a minute, for those of us who think we're good people. Every human being that's descended from Adam was stained with Adam's sin. Let me show you how that kind of thing happens. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 10 to 11. And as I may say, as I may so say, Levi also who received tithe, paid tithe in Abraham. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. If you read the book of Genesis, you'll see a story where Abraham met a king, the king of Salem, a man called Melchizedek. And Abraham, out of worship, gave Melchizedek a tenth of all that he had. Now, at the time that Abraham had this interaction with Melchizedek, Levi did not exist. In fact, Isaac had not been born. Amen? But the Bible says Levi paid a tithe to Melchizedek, even though he was not physically present. The way that Levi paid the tithe to Melchizedek is that when Abraham paid the tithe, Levi was in his loins. Levi was in him as we were in Adam. Amen? That is one of the reasons why the Bible says that the, the sins of the fathers are visited on the children. Because when the fathers are sinning, the children are in them. Amen? Abraham was Levi's grandfather. So when his grandfather paid the tithe, he was considered to have paid the tithe. Amen? So even though you were not born when Adam sinned, you were in his loins. That's what the Bible says in Romans chapter 5 verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way sin came to all people because all sinned. Sin entered through one man. And who was that man? Adam. And because of Adam, death came into all humanity. All men died because all sinned, because one sinned. And it wasn't just anyone, it was the first one. 
And that is one of the reasons why Jesus Christ is not a descendant of Adam. Do you realize that? Jesus Christ was not, a, was not in Adam's loins. Hallelujah. Amen? We'll come to that. When God made Adam, there was no death. God did not plan for us to die. That is why people are afraid of dying. And that is why we have no comprehension of death. Because God did not make us to die. That was not part of the plan. But once Adam sinned, he introduced death. Because the wages of sin is death. When God told Adam, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat from that tree, you will die. Oh. And then the devil said to Eve, you will not die, but you will become like God. Adam ate. And because he ate, we all die. Sin is what opened the door to death. In, in, in summary, it was Adam's fault. It was Adam's fault. His sin made all his descendants sinners. And just as he died because of his sin, all his descendants die. Amen? And, 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 and this is the problem with sin. Sin is a hindrance to God's purpose. Remember I said God made man. To have a multidimensional, multifaceted relationship with man. The biggest hindrance, the only hindrance to that relationship is sin. Sin is an obstacle to God's eternal purpose for creation. In Isaiah 59 verse 1, the Bible says, Listen, the Lord's arm is not too weak to save you, nor, his, nor is his ear too deaf to hear your call. It's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he has turned away and will not listen anymore. That is why the Bible says that God cannot hear the prayer of a sinner. But when we think about sin, we think about what men do. But sin is not about what men do, it is who men are. What we do proceeds out of who we are. Amen? Because of Adam, all men eventually die. And even worse than dying is that all men are separated from God. We have to understand that that is why the sin problem is not really a function of what you do. It is way beyond what you do. And that is why the solution to the sin problem cannot be about what you don't do. Amen? Only God could solve that problem. And how does he solve it? Let's read Romans chapter 5. I'll read from verses 12 to 14. It says, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. Now verse 13 says, To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. I want to pause there for a minute and address this issue. I heard somebody say recently that, uh, 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 that, uh, all men are not born sinners. That men sin when they break the law. And this is error. Let me tell you what the law does. The law is not what makes us sin. The law is what points our sin out to us. Amen? The Bible says, if the law did not say, thou shalt not covet, I would not have known that covetousness was problematic, right? But because the law said it, now I know. Let me tell you what happened. Before the law, men were sinning. Amen? The difference is that God did not charge it to their account. 
God did not credit it to anyone else, to anyone's account. The law is what made God start charging it to their account. Amen? But even though he didn't charge it to their account, they still experienced the death that Adam brought into humanity. Amen? Verse 14 says, Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses. Even though there was no law, there was still death. Even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is the pattern of the one to come. Everything started with one man. So everything has to end with one man. Romans 5.19 says, For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Amen? The first one, who was the first one? Adam. He messed everything up through his disobedience. The second one fixed it, how? Through his obedience. The first one made everybody a sinner. The second one makes everybody righteous. We serve a God who truly loves us. We serve a God who doesn't want anybody to perish. That is why in John 3, 16, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. What does it mean not to perish? It means that you don't die. So the reason why God sent Jesus is to remove death from the conversation of some people. Amen? Which people? Those that believe in him. Even Jesus himself testified in John chapter 10 verse 10. He says, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I am come that they may have what? Life. And they may have it more abundantly. Death is the opposite of life. You see, let me tell you something. Adam took away the choice of whether we were sinners or not. And one could make an argument that this is very unfair. I didn't choose to sin. It was Adam who made the choice. And all of humanity gets to pay the price. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you remember when we were, well, some of us, when we were kids, if you grew up in, a, in, in, in Nigeria, I don't know what happened in other African countries or the West, but where I grew up, if you, if you come from a, a, a large family, multiple siblings, maybe four or five, and you are the eldest, if one person messes up, you, who had nothing to do with it, you are responsible. If one person messes up, they punish everybody. Anybody ever experienced that? Uh, Adam was that guy, that last born. Adam, it was him. But in this case, he was the first born. Adam was the one who messed up. All of us, we get beat. Hallelujah. Was that fair? It wasn't fair. Adam made the choice, but guess what? We paid the price. He did the crime but we do the time. But the Bible says God is just. God is just. In Jeremiah 31, verse 29 to 30, the Bible says, in those days, people will no longer say, the parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Instead, everyone will die for their own sin. Whoever eats sour grapes, their own teeth will be set on edge. You know those pictures where they paint Adam with an apple? Have you seen any of those paintings? They should have actually have painted him with a bunch of sour grapes. Because Adam ate the grapes. But it is us, the children, whose teeth have been set on edge. But the Bible says a day is coming. Hallelujah. When the person, wake up, the person that eats the grape... The person where chop am. That is the person who we pay. And guess what? That day has come. And that is why he sent Jesus. And through Jesus, guess what? He gives all of humanity again the choice. 
Adam took away the choice. Jesus gives us back the choice. So what Jesus did, literally, was take all of us back to the Garden of Eden. Hallelujah. All of us will go back to the Garden of Eden. And it's almost as if God is saying again, Pastor Larry, choose. Hallelujah. Choose. The tree of life. Which is the cross. Or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Which is accountability and judgment. Which is represented by the law. If you choose Christ, guess what? The consequences of Adam's sin are erased from your account. But if you don't choose Christ, then now you have made the decision. It is no longer unfair. It is no longer unjust. Now you pay. Now you pay. In, in Adam, we did nothing to become sinners. In Christ, what do we do? Nothing to become righteous. And because of the first Adam, hear this, because of the first Adam, we are not only separated from God, but our bodies, touch your, touch your hand, touch, touch, touch your hand, you can feel it. Our bodies became subject to the power of sin and death. They kicked Adam out of the Garden of Eden, but they also kicked him out of the presence of God. Hallelujah. Now this is the beautiful thing about Jesus. The Bible says, through the second Adam, you know, let's read it. And I'll summarize what it means. It's, it's a long reading. Remember, I said it's not a TED talk. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 58. So the, the scriptures tell us the first man, Adam, he became a living person. But the last Adam, that is Christ, is a life-giving spirit. What comes first is the natural body. Then the spiritual body comes later. Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth, while Christ, the second man, came from heaven. Earthly people are like the earthly man, and heavenly people are like the heavenly man. Just as we are now like the earthly man, we will someday be like the heavenly man. What I am saying, brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. That means that our bodies that die have to be transformed into bodies that don't die. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sin is the sting that results in death. And the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. My brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always walk enthusiastically for the Lord. For you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. These bodies that we are in, because of Adam's sin, these bodies, if Jesus tarries, will die. These bodies cannot inherit 
what is coming. It cannot go where we are going because of Adam's sin. But Jesus has come. And because Jesus has come, when he comes back, when the last trumpet sounds, and that trumpet was always going to sound, when the last trumpet sounds, we will not be condemned to remain in the ground, in the dust. The Bible says our bodies will be transformed, those who are still alive. Their bodies will literally, in the twinkling of an eye, be transformed. And those who have died, they will be raised up. Because of the second Adam, the death of our bodies will be turned around. We will exchange mortality for immortality. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. We don't fully appreciate that without Christ, the end is the end. The end is the end. But in Christ, we could even go as far as saying, we don't, we don't die, we actually just sleep. To be woken with new bodies. Honestly, I won't lie to you, I'm looking forward to a new body. I, 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 I kid you not, I woke up this morning and I was like, man, I need a new body. I got out of my bed and my back said, whoa, <laughs> relax. I said, God, I need a new body. And the promise of God, the promise of God is that in Christ, your body will be transformed and it will never die. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. You know, Paul ends this description of what will happen to our bodies by saying, always work enthusiastically for the Lord because nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. The work of the church is critical to God's plans for the end. The work of the church is critical to taking humanity back into the Garden of Eden and giving them a choice. The Bible says all of creation is waiting expectantly for the manifestation of the sons of God. We are very critical parts of God's plan to restore all of humanity to the position that they had before Adam sinned. You and I, we have been saved for such a time as this. Hallelujah. Romans 8, 19. Creation is waiting for you. Don't you ever say they're waiting for you? Why, why is creation waiting for you? Because... Creation is waiting for deliverance from the law of sin and death. Creation is waiting for somebody to settle the quarrel with God. And who are the sons of God that creation is waiting for? Matthew chapter 5, Jesus Christ said, Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. Don't you know about say, Are you a peacemaker? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Those that make peace between men and God, they are the ones that will be called sons of God. So this morning, are you a son of God? Are you a daughter of God? Are you a peacemaker? Turn to your ask you, are you a peacemaker? Please ask them, in what way? Because your mouth is yes. In what way are you a peacemaker? I want to know. There are three ways you can be a peacemaker. So check yourself. There are three ways. Through your talents. Through your time. Or through your money. Treasure. But some people with treasure, you might misinterpret. So I'm calling it what it is, money. Listen, God has gifted you. Everything you have, talent, time, treasure, 
is a gift from God. Because there are people who do not have what you have. You wake up in the morning and say, Father, I thank you. If I tell all of us now to give thanks to God, all of us will give thanks because we recognize that we stand, we live, we move, we eat by the grace and mercy of God. What we have is a gift from God. But we need to understand that those gifts are given not just for us to consume, but so that we can be a part of reconciliation. Are you a part of reconciliation? Who have you reconciled to God? Who have you been a part of their reconciliation to God? Let me tell you something. Everything that God has blessed you with, he expects that you will benefit from those things. He expects that you will use what he has given you to make yourself comfortable. Amen? Thank God. But he also gives it to you to facilitate reconciliation. Let me tell you why. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18, it says, do not muzzle the ox that is treading out the grain. Then it says, the worker deserves his wages. You should benefit from, you should enjoy the fruit of your labor. Yes? Are we in agreement? Yes. But you see, the problem is this. When the ox not only treads the grain, but eats all of the grain, what does the farmer do to that ox? Shish kebab. Barbecue, straight. Fire. At a minimum, they will replace the ox. And when they replace the ox, let me tell you what happens. That ox that was eating all the grain loses access to grain. They just send him out. And he goes from eating quality food to eating whatever it is it can find. The gospel, the ministry of reconciliation needs your time. Don't deceive yourself. It needs your talent and, and needs your treasure. L listen, I thank God for technology. I thank God for technology. Technology has made it easier for us to preach the gospel. Amen? Amen. When Jesus walked the face of the earth, everybody was walking. There were no cars. And then go back into the 70s and 80s and 90s. Before the advent of the internet, if we wanted to do evangelism, we had to walk around knocking on doors and giving out tracts. We're laying people on the highway, yelling at people in buses. These days, in Texas, everybody has a car. And not everybody's going to come to church. And with what our evangelical brothers are doing in the political realm these days, nobody wants to go to church. Except those who are already in church. So where do we meet people? Online. On social media. We used to think social media was a bad thing. My brothers and sisters, social media is God's way of making sure more people hear the gospel. Mark Zuckerberg, who, what did Zuckerberg do? Facebook, right? That guy, eh, was being used by God. He doesn't know. That thing that he invented, Facebook, who did Instagram? Is this the same Zuckerberg? He bought it from somebody. Uh, he bought Instagram. Uh, and then Instagram has blown up. Then they did Snapchat and WhatsApp, and Twitter. What else? Discord, Twitch. Thread. Some of you haven't even heard of Discord. Some of you haven't heard of Twitch. Pastor Larry, have you heard of Twitch? Pastor Larry. Pastor Larry is still on MySpace. The number of people, listen, the number of people on social media platforms is mind-boggling. Young people, old people. My father, my father is 80. His friends are on Facebook. Those are the older, older people. My father is on IG. He 
might even be on TikTok. I don't know. <laughs> let me tell you, but let me tell you the people that are the most on those platforms, young people. You know, we keep saying young people are leaving the church. And they are. But we know where they are. They're on social media. They're on TikTok. They're on Snapchat. Not on MySpace. But they're on Instagram. They're on Twitter. They're on Twitch. They're on threads. They're, they're, they're there. And they spend more time there than you can imagine. So where should we go and meet them? There. Because they need to hear the message. It is not fair if they don't hear the message. But in order for you to, to preach or to facilitate reconciliation on those platforms, what do you need? You need content. Not just anyhow content. Good quality, excellent content. Do you know why? Those platforms will push your powerful content to the back. Nobody will see it if the quality is not excellent. So somebody who is preaching the gospel of Satan but is excellent, they will hear that person before you. But we have the capacity, we have the capability to be excellent. They are designed to favor well-produced content, excellent video quality, excellent sound, excellent video production, excellent content. But that kind of content does not fall from the sky. It is not by prayer. Amen? In order to get that kind of content, guess what you need? You need time. You need time. You need creativity. You need technical skill. You need equipment. You need physical space. But creativity does not fly in the air. God gave it to some people. Technical ability, you don't pluck it on a tree. God gave it to people. Production equipment does not fall from the sky. You need money to buy it. But, but the creative Christians, they're too busy. They're too busy. They don't have time to use their creativity for Christ. The people who have technical skills are too tired from their three IT jobs to, to, to worry about the gospel. And the people with the money are on their way to Cabo. The, the fourth holiday of the year to, to Cabo, right? Or is it Santorini? Mm, gospel. Oh, yeah. mm. I'm tired. You see, the ox should eat some of the corn. But sometimes it forgets that it was given access to corn, not to eat all of it, but to help the farmer bring in the harvest. To help the farmer bring home the harvest. That is why the Bible says that the harvest is plentiful. But the laborers, eh, they are few. Pray ye the Lord of the harvest. That he sent his laborers. And can I tell you something? I prayed. And I am praying. And guess what? I can see a lot of laborers. Oh yes. This church is full. This church is full. You know what that tells me? God did not send just pew warmers here. You know why this church has filled up? Because we are talking about Jesus. There are churches who do motivational speaking better than us, Pastor Tosin, Tosin have you? Oh, there are churches who do gimmicks and props better than us. We are going to do some, but we can't compete. We don't even try and compete. What we do is what we do, Jesus. We don't do TED Talks, just Jesus. So God has sent you to this church. But all you can think about is Cabo. All you can think about. Are you going to Kabul? Ah, uh, I know, I know. 
I know. I know. There are creative people in this service this morning. There are creative people watching the service online complaining about the video quality. Complaining about the sound. Say, ah. They will, they will send me things. Say, Pastor, I mean, the sound is so bad. Oh, you know how much a microphone costs? Say, Pastor, I mean, you guys can do better with the lighting. I, I know we can do better with the lighting. I know. I know. It, but it's not free. Alas, I wish it was. There are people here who are saying that the way they are holding that camera, if they only could tilt it a little bit, maybe the filter they're using, what, what is it? Are they using 3.6? You know, but you are sitting here folding your hands. When the sound is bad and PF is complaining, you are shaking your head that those guys don't know what they're doing. But you know what they're doing. But you are sitting down there. You are like that ox that they said, eat small corn. And leave the rest for the farmer. You say, no. No, no, no. I earned it. I will eat it. Let the farmer take a little. You know, if you even gave the farmer, left the farmer with only 10%, the farmer would be happy. But many of us are content to just eat the whole thing and say the farmer will be okay. My brothers and sisters, it's all about the gospel. It's all about the gospel. Where is your time? Where is your talent? And where is your treasure? If none of those are involved in the gospel, if none of those are involved in the gospel, you do yourself a disservice. You do yourself a disservice. Say, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. I want that when I get to heaven, you know, as you, as you start to get older, you start to think about some things that young people don't think about. You start to think that, what will they say when I arrive? The only thing that matters, well done, good and faithful servant. And it doesn't matter whether it is time that you gave. It doesn't matter whether it is talents that you gave. It doesn't matter whether it is treasure that you gave. It is that you were faithful with what you were given. I want to encourage you, my brothers and sisters. A Christianity that is just for you, that just benefits you, that doesn't do anything for anyone else. You're just... I won't say the thoughts that came to my mind. But it's almost like God gave resources to somebody who does nothing with the resources. We're here for a time such as this. We are blessed for a time such as this. Remember Esther says, Esther said, for a time such as this, in this season, in this season, the church, the church's voice needs to be heard. Amen. Not in politics. Amen. Not in politics. But Jesus. The people who have the platforms, they corrupt the message with politics. And the people who know Christ, are on their way to Cabo. <laughs> Making way. We, we, we make way. We, we give room to the people talking nonsense. Let us bow our heads and pray. I've, I've spoken enough. I want to challenge you today. I want to challenge you today. Where, what are you doing with your time? What are you doing with your treasure? What are you doing with your talents? What are you doing for the gospel? In a few minutes, the offering basket will pass in front of you. 
That is an opportunity for your treasure. That's an opportunity for you to give so that we can pay for equipment. So that we can pay for space. But beyond that, some of us may not have treasure to give. But we have talent. We can sing. We can play a musical instrument. We can, we understand videos and how they work. We are social media experts. We know the algorithms. We know how to beat them. And then your time. You sit down in front of the television, watching Premier League, watching other people live in their purpose while yours is passing you by. My brothers and sisters, it is time for us to rise up. It says the whole of creation is waiting for you. There are people waiting. People waiting. When somebody sends you a post, you see a TikTok that makes you laugh. You send it to your friends. But then you hear something about Jesus. See, why are they always sending me these things? That one, you won't send it. You don't want to be that guy or that girl. Says, if you are not ashamed of me in front of men, I will not be ashamed of you in front of my father. It's time for us to take this gospel seriously. That is why we have been blessed in this season and in this time. And so, Father, we thank you. Almighty God, we, we bless you and we give you praise. Father, we commit each and every one of your children into your hands. We ask Almighty God in the name of Jesus that you will help us understand that we are laborers in your vineyard. You have given us all the things that you have given us to propagate the message of the second Adam, the last Adam, of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Help us, almighty God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we have prayed. In the mighty name of Jesus, we have prayed. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah.